Well, it's great to see you here. Appreciate you being with us. Uh, invite you to take your Bible and please do turn to the book of Ephesians. We've been studying from that work for uh, a few weeks now on Sunday nights. Uh, not trying to do justice to the book fully, but to give a bit of an overview of the book and to look at some of its great messages. And it is a great message. Uh, a wise fellow I heard one time talking about this book said that it's a book that will stretch your mind. And I found that to be true. And uh, even in reading the book uh, uh, and working with uh, this, uh, this series of lessons, uh, it has been uh, uh, a very uh, powerful experience for me, a good reminder uh, to, uh, to think about Christianity in its true context. You know, you know <laughs> I suppose, and I'm not accusing anybody here of this, but I, I think there are maybe some folks that sit in pews like this who sort of think of the Church of Christ as a, a social club. Uh, my granddaddy was a member, and uh, I, I've been a member. I sort of like it, like the people, and um, something else about it appeals to me. But we would see that that's a very superficial view of who we are and what we're about. And Ephesians is, is one of those places where the Lord just grabs us by the scruff of the neck and says, you need to understand that being a Christian is a, a, metaphor, a, a, a metaphysical experience. You know, this is about things that you cannot see with your eye. Uh, he, he talks about in verse 3 of chapter 1 about all spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ. And we looked in previous lessons, and we'll not go back and re-preach those, about some examples that he gives about, about forgiveness and about redemption and about being sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. These are not things you can see with the eye. Uh, they're not things you can feel with the physical touch. But their reality is, is unquestioned. And the, the meaningfulness and the power of those things is worth more than all the physical things that we can think of. That's where the riches are. That's where the blessing of being a Christian is. It's not as the old um, health and wealth gospel advocates used to say, give the Lord $10, he'll give you back 100 It's about something a lot deeper and more important than that. Uh, and so Paul has reminded the Ephesian brethren uh, of that fact. Now we pick up tonight in verse 15 of chapter 1 and uh, notice these words. Wherefore, I think, having given us a taste of the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We looked at that term as well. It, it describes, uh, best I can, can uh, rephrase it, the non-earthly. You know, th this is the place where we sit with Christ. This is the place where the, the true enemies are to be found. As we'll read later in chapter 6. So Christianity is not just about what you can see. It's about rewards and enemies and the struggle that go beyond and outside of this life. So, he says, Wherefore, I also, having heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So Paul here pauses to tell them how much he appreciates them. He said, I've heard of your faith. We mentioned this, and we're not going to spend much time on it now any more than we did then. But uh, you, once in a while we run into uh, somebody who will write about the book of Ephesians and they will question whether or not this book is written to Ephesus at all. Uh, at least not uh, in any major way. That it might have been a circular letter. They'll point out how that there are a few manuscripts, older manuscripts, where back in verse 1 of chapter 1, the word at Ephesus or that phrase is left out. And they will say, maybe this wasn't a letter after all written to Ephesus particularly. And they will say, well, you know, it seems to me with all the track record and history uh, of this book that surely there would have been more personal references and they go on like that. You know, I, I don't know that it really makes all that much difference. Uh, but this is a passage that oftentimes is pointed to. Um, he talks about how that I've heard of your faith. Isn't that a strange thing for Paul to say about a church that he knew so well? Well, not necessarily. I mean, he certainly did know the church there well. And if you go back to Acts, we can read how that uh, his uh, introduction to that particular place goes back to Acts chapter uh, 17, I believe it is, um, where he uh, 
or 18, I should say, uh, where he uh, goes by for a quick visit on the first occasion. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, had been left in Sincrea. They came to Ephesus uh, and, uh, and left uh, Aquila and Priscilla there uh, with the, with the, uh, in that city. Uh, the work seems to have been planted there. Uh, and uh, he leaves. He comes back uh, by with a quick trip. He doesn't even go to Ephesus. He meets with the elders, uh, the Ephesian elders. But uh, later on in chapter 20, uh, in chapter 19, we find on the third journey, Paul making his major push there, uh, spends three plus years there, and it's quite an eventful work. So the point is he knows them well. He has certainly had a long history with that church. Uh, and he says, uh, I've heard of your faith. Well, I don't think that necessarily means he didn't know them. It had been some time since he had been there. Uh, and you remember the, another example, uh, a letter written at the same time is the letter we call Philemon. Uh, Paul writes to this uh, Colossian Christian, and he's obviously a fellow that Paul knows well. And as you read that little letter, you remember how that Paul uh, has quite a history with him. But at one point in this letter, Philemon, uh, verse 4, uh, he writes, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. He's heard of that. What is that suggesting? Well, I think it means it's been a while since he's seen him and he continues to hear good things about him. I don't think it means he didn't know him or he hadn't been with him in the past. So, in other words, just for what it's worth, I don't think that's an argument that proves that this letter wasn't written to the church at Ephesus. I think it suggests that Paul had been absent with him for a while, but he continued to hear good things about the work there. And in fact, those good things were on his mind. He ceased not to thank God for them, making mention in his prayers. This is a great reminder. We just saw it in the reference we read from Philemon about how Paul prayed for his brethren. He prayed for them by name. Let me, let me urge you again, those of you here, every member of this congregation, don't let a day go by that you do not call the name of your brethren in prayer. Not that big a church, not that big a list. <laughs> but pray, don't just pray for the brethren, but pray for your brethren here. Ask God to bless them. Thank God for them. By name. We need that. We're going to have in a little while our monthly prayer meeting, we call it. And, and we mostly concentrated that meeting on those who are not of regulars of this number because we assume that everybody is praying for the folks here. Pray for your brethren. Uh, I think that not only is, is the practice of Paul, but I think it's also significant that he thought of the good things going on uh, with the Philemon or with the church at, at uh, Ephesus. You know, there's a value in remembering the good things. There's a time for us to pray because we know somebody's got trouble in their life or somebody's not as faithful as they ought to be or somebody seems to be going through a bad time and we want to pray for them, and that's right. But even when we find ourselves concerned about people, maybe we're crossways with them about something, remember the good things as well. And pray, don't forget to pray and thank God for the positive. I may have shared this with some of you before. I'm sure I probably have. But years ago, when I lived up north, we uh, were trying to get uh, a, an effort, doing some door knocking during the day. We were having a meeting at night. Several fellows from different areas would come up there to this place. Anyway, and so it was rather late after the meeting one night, and fellows just got to commiserating with their brethren about some of the things that they were going through. I don't think it was a gossip session. They were just sort of... I guess, you know, problems on their mind and troubles and things that had disappointed them and uh, they were dealing with. And so one fellow would tell about something he was struggling with and you know how that gets contagious. And here's another fellow and he began to talk about some problem there. Here's a problem there. And uh, that went on for several minutes. And there was a wise old brother who was sitting over there, hadn't said a word. And he listened to that for a little while. And I'll never forget it. And he spoke up without any disrespect, and he said, let's talk about some good things. Let me tell you about a brother that I know, or a sister, I forget now what it was. He told some story about some sacrificial work on the part of somebody or some special kindness that they had shown. 
And as a young preacher, and I was pretty young back then, uh, that really made an impression on me. That old fellow was making a point with us uh, because all of us were younger than he was. And, and without saying any more than that, he was just telling us, fellas, you got to deal with problems, but don't just see problems. And don't just pray about problems. Remember the good and thank God for the good. Uh, and, and I thought uh, even in the, in, the, in the prayer tonight, we're thanking God. You know, our country is just burdened with a lot of wickedness and sin and corruption, and we're all concerned about that. But don't, don't cease to thank God for the fact that we do live with freedom and we still can meet and there are good things and good people. And certainly when it comes to our brethren, Paul didn't just see problems at Ephesus, there were some, but he, he prayed for them and thanked God for their faith. And I think one more thing I might mention here quickly is, you know, we learn from Paul, tell others we're praying for them. I appreciate again uh, the prayer that's offered when, when they, when the, Folks mention me or Donald and I in the prayer. Let me tell you, I speak for Donald here. It, it makes a difference. It matters to know that folks are praying for you. I'm sure we all feel that way. There's a place that needs to be made for going up to somebody and telling them, I want you to know I'm praying for you by name. I'm praying for you as you raise your kids. I'm praying for you as you deal and struggle with the troubles that come with old age or the problem that you have in your life or the good things that you're doing or trying to do. I thank God for you and I'm praying for you. Uh, I, I know how that feels. I've been blessed to be on the other end of that. And I, I think there's a power in that. Paul didn't just pray for them. He wanted them to know he was praying for them and he mentioned it. And I think that's a practice that will help us. Let's move on now in verse 17. He's praying for them, and he's praying in addition this prayer, not just a prayer of thanksgiving, but he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, this is the old translation, he's praying that God may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I don't think he's praying for a miracle here. I think what he's doing is he's just praying that God will help them to see what's before them and that they'll be able to see the truth about certain things. As he says in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand far above all principality and might and power and every dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things, I'm sorry, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So what's Paul's prayer here? It is that they might know certain things. Again, forgive me if this is an old illustration, but I tell you, we ought to remember how that there's power in just knowing certain things. I mean, just knowing things can change reality. Uh, it can change uh, our mindset. It can turn a hardship that seems unbearable into something that uh, we're more than conquerors for. You know, there was something that happened to Paul not long before he wrote this letter, not too many years. You know, in Acts chapter 27, uh, there's a story there about Paul's shipwreck. He wrote these letters, I think the letters like uh, Ephesus, uh, Ephesians, I should say, and Colossians, and, uh, and Philemon, and Philippians, from, from prison there in Rome. Uh, but his trip to Rome was a harrowing journey. Uh, Acts 27 tells that story about Paul uh, being involved in a shipwreck, which I guess is sort of their equivalent to an airline crash. You know, I think probably fewer people survive airline crashes than shipwrecks, but it was a true disaster. And this is at least number four for Paul, if we're counting. You know, Paul in, in, Col in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 had written there, Thrice I was shipwrecked. But he wrote that letter before this happened, if I understand the, the uh, chronology. 
So, um, <laughs> Paul had faced a lot of dangers in traveling around for the cause of Christ. And so it is here. Uh, verse 20 of chapter Acts 27 says, uh, when neither the sun nor the stars uh, in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. That's Luke writing. And after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened to me, shouldn't have left when you did. But he said, be that as it may, verse 22, Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. I believe God that it shall be even as was told me. The angel of God came to Paul when it looked like all hope was lost. And what did he do? He stopped the storm. No, he didn't. He uh, picked the boat up and, and moved it to a safe. No, he didn't do that either. Uh, what did he do? He just told him some information. He said, I want you to know something. I want you to know nobody's going to die on this ship. If you stay on this ship, God's going to save every one of them. It was 276, wasn't it? And everybody's going to make it. <laughs> they didn't think anybody was going to make it. Verse 33, same chapter. And when the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying... This day is the 14th day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not fall a hair from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Notice verse 36. And then... They were all of good cheer, and they took some meat. It's amazing the difference that just believing the truth of God's message, what a difference it made in the whole outlook of this thing. And I think back on this letter that we're looking at here in Ephesians, I think it's the same point that Paul's making here. Let me tell you something that you need to make it, something that will be absolutely essential to you in a world filled with trouble and danger. I want you to know three things that will make all the difference. And the first one, he said, I want you to know the hope of his calling. You know, hope is a powerful thing in a hopeless world. We live in a hopeless world. Uh, we live in a world whose greatest hope seems to be, boy, I hope that when I die, I don't wake up. Because if I do, I'm in big trouble. That's the way the world thinks. Now, that's pathetic. But hope, the hope that the Christian has in this world is a powerful difference. You know, the Apostle Peter uh, wrote powerfully about, about hope uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1 there. This is a letter written to people who were undergoing trials and difficulty. And, and Peter wanted them to know certain things. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according, which according to his abundant mercy, verse 3, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. That's a great expression. It's not just a hope. It's a living hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul will make the same point in just a moment. Our hope is to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith under salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. He said, I want you to remember that you are people who have a living hope. It is absolutely shameful that we as Christians 
would have the same kind of sorry fear that the world has. Hold your finger there and turn back to, to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, Paul writes to this church, young church, good church. Folks who had, had obeyed the gospel in a hard, difficult time. And he writes to them and he says in verse 13, they had a question, you remember. You know, here we are, we've obeyed the gospel, we're waiting for the Lord to come, but he hadn't come yet. What about those who die before he comes? Are, have they lost out? No, they haven't lost out. They just were young, they didn't know. And so Paul writes to them and he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, a metaphor for a figure of speech for those who've died, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. I've never been one of those guys who believed that we ought to turn a funeral into a party. Uh, I, I think there's a, a, a natural sorrow that comes with losing somebody that we love. But there's a huge difference, and you know this is true, between sorrowing and sorrowing as those who have no hope, that our, our, our hope is not lost just because in this, this life will end. We expect it to end. And we don't look at life and death the way that the world does. We don't live this life the way they live it. Back in Matthew chapter 6, we remember the Lord's words there of, of exhortation when he called on us to have a different outlook about, about the time we spend here. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 31, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things of the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. So what he pleads with us to do is to not look at life like the world does. Why? Because we have a living hope. We're looking for something better than this life. We never expected to live here forever. If our life here is shortened, so be it. We don't look to shorten our life. Here, but we, we just will yield to what comes because we look for something beyond this life. And, and that hope, let me go back to Peter just a moment. That, first Peter, that, that hope is not just an interesting theory. It's what motivates us. You know, Paul said if you know the hope of your calling, it will change your life. And Peter makes the same point. If you keep reading in first Peter, you look in chapter 3, you know, Peter talks in this letter, doesn't he, about various situations, hardships that may come. Trying to submit, for example, to a government, to a king that may not always be righteous. And to live under government and the trials that that bring. Or living sometimes in a marriage relationship where it's hard. Here's a woman, for example, married to a man who does not respect Christ. And how difficult that can be. There are all kinds of situations in life that are going to bring us to trial where we're going to be mistreated. And it's that context of, of, of 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. Finally, my brethren, he writes, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, the old translation says. That is, be full of pity or compassion. And be courteous, to be literally friendly-minded, to be kind. Now that's easy to do when you're around people are treating you right. But can you do it when people are treating you like yesterday's trash? That's the hard part for me. Well, it's always been the hard part. You're not the first one, Wesley. Deal with it. Deal with it like a Christian. Deal with it like somebody's got some hope. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, abusive language for abusive language, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are hereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. Isn't that the same le lesson that Paul taught there? Let me tell you what you need to win this fight. You need to know that you have a hope, a living hope, and we're not going to trade that off for some cheap vengeance. 
We're going to yield as people who know there is a God who is in position and has the right to take care of those things. And he continues here in 1 Peter. He quotes from the psalm, Psalm 34, I think it is. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil. That's a great old word we don't use anymore. Eschew evil is not just uh, the idea of, of choosing not to do it. It's actively seeking to get away from it. It's, it's a mindset that, that, that has a horror of evil. To eschew evil and to do good. To seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if he be followers of that which is good? And I, every time I read that, I think that there might be somebody looking at that and wondering, has Peter lost his mind? Who will harm you? I got news for you. A lot of people are going to harm you. Don't you know that? Oh, yeah, I think Peter knew that. I think he sure did. You know what Peter knew? Peter knew from the time he was a young man that he would not die an old man who falls asleep one day and just doesn't wake up in his bed surrounded by loved ones. Let me tell you what the Lord told him early on. Peter, one of these days somebody's going to tie you up, take you where you'd rather not go. I just want you to know that. And he did, and he served God anyway for decades. I don't think Peter needs a lecture from me on suffering for the cause, but what he was saying and I'm just too dull to get it. He was saying, Wesley, let me tell you something. Uh, there are a lot of people that try to hurt you, but they can't really hurt you. Who can really hurt you if you're followers of what's good? That's what he's telling them. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror and don't be troubled. Let me pause there one more time. Don't answer out, but just think within yourself. How many folks do you know that have got that down. How many folks that you know that can take abuse and, re and, and return good for evil and will, can, can hold their Christianity when they're being mistreated? I don't think that's common, even among those of us that mean well. But here's what Peter said, you do it anyway. And sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Because if you can do that, you know, unless you just lost your mind, there must be something that allows you to hold your dignity and principle when you're being mistreated by people who have no principle. And how do you do that? You do that because you have a hope in you. You know something that they don't know. And when it's all said and done, they're going to come around and ask you, what do you know that I don't know? And then you can tell them about the hope that's in you. You can talk to them about trusting in a God that watches over you. And that sometimes we might be called to suffer for righteousness' sake. That's a shocking thought. Verse 17, it is better... If the will of God so be that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. I'm an old man and I still struggle with that sometimes. The concept that maybe it's God's will that I, that I suffer for well-doing. He's got a bigger plan. I don't see it all. But I know my job is to never return evil for evil. Never! So, how do you have the strength to do that? You know something. You have a hope. And that's a theme that runs throughout the New Testament, doesn't it? Let me mention something else before we quit tonight. The second thing that Paul, back in our text in, in, in Ephesians 1, he says, I want you to know what is the hope of his calling. And then the second thing he said is, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? When I started reading Ephesians as a young Christian, I think the way I read that was something like this, that he was referring to the inheritance that God has waiting for us as his adopted children. 
our inheritance in him. Well, I believe in our inheritance in him. I think that's what that first phrase is talking about, I hope. But I don't think that's what he's talking about here. You correct me if I've misread it now, but I think as I read the passage, what he's talking about, when he says his inheritance, the his refers to God. His inheritance in the saints, not the saints' inheritance in God, but the saints as his inheritance. And the first time that finally got through my thick skull, it really opened up quite a thought to me. The concept of God's inheritance. <laughs> he made everything, didn't he? He did. But you know, he doesn't keep it all, does he? Think about all that God made. He made everything. I think God alone is eternal. We, we look sometimes and we, we, we enjoy the view of the mountains or the ocean and we think, well, that's just always been there. Well, of course it hadn't always been there. It'll always be there. No, it won't. No, it won't. In fact, uh, we were in Peter a moment ago. If we go back to the book of uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, he makes it plain there that there's a day coming in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God made those things, but he didn't make them to keep. As glorious as they are, they're a little bit like one of those old Dixie cups, you know. When I was a kid, I used to buy the Dixie cups because we didn't want to wash dishes or whatever the reason was. And you got them, and you're glad you got them, and you use them, but when you get through with them, they're gone. They're disposable. They're not made to keep. Well, you know, God made these great beings, the angels. I believe he did make the angels. There was a time when I, I believe there was not, time may not be the right word, I don't even know how to describe it, but there was a point at which there was no angel. The angels had a beginning. Only God has no beginning. The angels are mighty beings, they're marvelous beings, but in the same passage in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, he points out how that the angels that sinned were not spared. They were cast down to hell, delivered into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. The angels that sinned are likewise not going to be kept by God. They are going to be separated from him. All the magnificent beasts of the earth are, well, Peter once described to some men as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. God has made a marvelous animal life. It's interesting sometimes from a Bible point of view to think about why God made the animals, and maybe I still don't know the answer to that. But one thing I do believe I see is that only man was made in the image of God because God intended to keep man. Man has that which he shares with God that eternal aspect, that, that aspect that lives on. But not even all men will be God's inheritance. If you look back in uh, Paul's letter in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, you remember this passage? You who are troubled, rest. That's the reward of the troubled. They have rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Some of the modern speech translations maybe are a little more exact there. They render it something along the lines of, they shall be punished away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. What's the point? The point is that even with most men, most people, most human beings made in the image of God, they won't be with God for eternity. They'll be punished away from the presence of God. So we come back to our question, the, the inheritance of God. What does God keep of what he's made? Especially in the material universe. What does he keep? He keeps you. That's what he keeps. He keeps that remnant he keeps those 
who obey him and hold to him. There's another word for that. It's called the church. The true, the faithful, the saints. That's the way uh, Ephesians is uh, labeled. Look back in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body. The fullness of him that fills all in all. I hope to say more about this passage uh, maybe in the next lesson because our time's up tonight. But, but in verse 16 of chapter 2, there's just, I don't know where you stop, where you put a chapter division. This whole thing just goes on, doesn't it? Um, that he might reconcile, 216, that he might reconcile both, Jew and Gentile, he's talking about here, under God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. God has reconciled. This is his inheritance. He's cleansed us from our sin and brought us, Jew and Gentile, to himself by the cross. And came and preached peace, unity, being united with his inheritance. To them which are afar off and to them which are nigh. That through him we both have access. Notice the words here that suggest fellowship. By one spirit under the Father. Now you're no more strangers and foreigners and fellow citizens, but, but rather he says fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. What is the, what is the, the inheritance of God? You are. By the grace of God, by the work of Christ, we are. And what a joy that is. Do you get up every morning thinking about that? Do you go to bed at night thinking about that? We got all kind of problems and we're concerned about the price of groceries and how we're going to pay the insurance bill and all kind of things that come up. But Paul, again, by the Holy Spirit, takes us by the collar and says, you need to think about important things. More important than anything, just the physical and the mundane that have their place, but things that are, are eternal things that are a part of the, the heavenly. Think about the hope of his calling and think about the glory of his inheritance and think about the great power of God to usward who believe. Look in chapter 2. We'll read this and then we'll talk about it next time, Lord willing. You hath he quickened. Now, the King James supplies hath he quickened in verse 1. It's later on in the text, verse 5. But uh, most of the translations leave out that that is supplied by the translator. It just says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. He wants us to understand where we came from. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, that is a great passage and filled with meaning. 
But the hope is that you and I will realize that we have so much to be thankful for that the problems, no matter how real they are in this life, just cannot ever get on top of us. They cannot because everything in this life is temporary, but these are things that are eternal. Uh, I hope that that's a lesson that I can take to heart, and I hope you do as well. Let's talk about more about these first 10 verses or so and the rest of the chapter in our next study. Appreciate very much your kind attention tonight. I realize these are rather fundamental things, but sometimes going back to the fundamentals and knowing them, as we've tried to say, can make a lot of difference in the way we handle life and can help us with a lot of the discouragements that the devil tries to trip us up with. If you're here tonight, you're not a child of God. I, I say with all respect, you're just missing the most important thing about being alive. And, and you, you gotta get that right. And the Lord wants to help you. And he longs for you. And he opens his arms to you, but he, he's not gonna force us. And so we just need to lay down whatever hinders us and come to him come on his terms come in faith we believe Jesus to be the son of God we believe the gospel we'll confess it before men we don't care who knows it we come in repentance ashamed of sin we come to make a change of life to be buried and raised to walk in newness of life we come to be baptized for the remission of our sin and to be baptized into Christ that's your desire tonight. We'd be glad to help you. If you're here as one who is a child of God, has not been faithful to the promise you made, and, and, and the one to whom you made it, then please come back to him. If there's some way we can help you, be glad to pray with you, pray for you. Let us know how. While we stand and sing, will you come? <laughs>